Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. It's a different day here, but that's okay, amen? amen. Uh, first of all, before we go any further, before I lose my life prematurely, let me uh, say Happy Mother's Day to all the ladies in the house. We do it a little different here at Passion. We honor all the women in the house, amen? amen? And so we have a gift for you back there on the table, but we're delighted that you're here this morning. Uh, let me say thank you to several people this morning. I, I would probably... I know I, I would be making a huge mistake if I didn't. I want to thank, first of all, Southwestern Christian University for allowing us to use this building. Amen. That's a huge help for us. Otherwise, we would have just had to cancel all together. And so on a moment's notice, they allowed us to do that, and we appreciate that. I want to thank um, our team, our pastoral team, our usher, greeters, tech team especially, worship team, all the teams that uh, showed up last night and this morning to get ready. Uh, so that we can have church in here, and so we're thankful for that. And then we want to, I, I realize this is different, but let me say a couple things that it, it's made me aware of about our building. First of all, it makes you thankful that the, that the Lord gave us a facility. Uh, it's not all about the building, but aren't you thankful that we have a place to meet every week? Well, we don't have to set up and tear down every week. Thank the Lord. We did that for a long time. I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, but we are thankful. It makes you not take what we have for granted. And so I'm thankful for that. I also uh, am thankful that the Lord um, spared our building because uh, it could have been a lot worse than it was. Uh, we knew we were having an issue on, what day was that, Friday, Woody? Thursday. Thursday, we knew we were having an issue because some plugs started going out. And well, Stuart and Cassidy went up to clean yesterday. And when they flipped the lobby lights on, the lights didn't come on. The fans did. They started spinning, and then they slowed down. And then smoke started billowing down the hallway. So Stuart ran and uh, killed the power, called uh, 911. Fire trucks showed up and nothing. So we're just blessed this morning. I need you to pray. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit to work on an electrician. We, he's coming sometime this week. He's a great guy, uh, and he's helped us before, but we need the only Holy Spirit to help him find what's wrong, because we don't know if it's a lightning hit, or a, uh, a, he said there could be a neutral loss somewhere. You think about that, somewhere, and $90 an hour, somewhere. And so, uh, <laughs> y'all pray hard tomorrow and the rest of the week that he can find that, but I'm thankful that the Lord uh, spared us. But you know, the other thing that I want to draw to your attention to is it also reminded me, I, I was reminded of this very early on yesterday when we discovered what was going on. It really reminds us this isn't really about a building. The church is not a building. I'm thankful for the building and it's a, it's a gift from the Lord, but it's not about the building. It's about you. And the fact is we're a church whether we have a building or not. We're body, we're family. And so I'm delighted that you're here this morning and that we get to spend a great day together. And that we gave, we uh, we decided that it would be easier not to have children's ministry, but it also makes us thankful for all our children's workers on Sundays. Amen. And we got our children's workers are in here today. You you ought to thank them. For what they do. Well, we started a series last week, and uh, we're going to continue this morning. Uh, and we began to talk about. The idea of a thread. A thread is this small, unseen thing that doesn't seem very significant until you pull on it. Uh, when when it sticks out of a anybody ever done that where you have this like a little snag and you go, oh it's no big deal. I just pull it out and then bite it off. I bite it off. Y'all go get scissors. I know, but I bite it. I bite it off, and all of a sudden it's just like everything disappears on your garment and you have to take it off, and throw it away. And it didn't seem like it was very significant until you pull on it, right? And then you understand. That it was this significant, uh, serious issue, and, and that it was important, and that the thread was important to the overall garment. And so last week we backed up and we began to talk about the thread that weaves throughout, not only throughout Scripture, 
but it, it weaves throughout history and it, 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 it weaves through the tapestry of our story and, and, and Christianity as a whole. And we began to talk about that and we went backwards. We went into uh, all the way back even before the beginning. We went back before God ever said, let there be anything. On uh, Before day one, this thread was mentioned because the Bible said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 that the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God hovered over the earth. And, and we talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit was mentioned even before there was a day one. And that the Holy Spirit wants to hover over our chaos and our mess. And a lot of times what the Holy Spirit is doing is he's just hovering over your mess, trying to keep it all together until your mess can get a message that God has a word for you and that God can straighten it all out. And so we need to pay attention to, to the beginning words. But this morning what we're going to do is we're going to travel forward. We started at the beginning and now what we want to do is we want to go to last words. Uh, how many of you know that last words are important? Uh, anybody ever been with somebody when they spoke their last words? When they say their last words, those words are extremely important. When you pull it all down and you're about to leave this planet and you can only say a few more words, how many of you know most of us stop and really think about those words and they become extremely valuable, extremely weighty, and extremely important? And so Jesus, uh, on his moments before he leaves the planet, he speaks to his disciples and he gives his last words. And most of us think that we know what those last words are or were. Uh, if you've read scripture at all, you think that what he did is he looked at his disciples and the very last thing he said to them was what he said to Matthew, go and make disciples, right? That's the last words he ever spoke, right? Wrong. That is not the last words he spoke. The last marching orders, the very last instructions that he gave them before he left the planet was this. After appearing, after his resurrection, he appeared many times to them. Jesus measures his words, and in his last few words, he turns to them, and in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he gives them his very last words. This is what he says. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's the last thing he said. That then you turn into Acts chapter 1, it won't be on the screen for you, but it's validated again. And the writer of, the author of Acts tells us that once again that Jesus says to them, go and stay in the city until you receive power. So his last words were to wait, not to go. We always want to talk about Jesus said go, but his last words to his disciples was, was wait. Wait. And that's what they did. They waited. He tells them they should gather together in Jerusalem and they should wait. So therefore, when you begin to read Acts, when you finish his last words and you come into the book of Acts, Acts is nothing more than the account of obedience to that command to wait. That's what Acts is. In fact, uh, what, you, what you discover when you start messing around in Acts, especially the first part of Acts, is what you discover is you discover a group of demoralized frightened, uncertain, discouraged men and women who are gathered in a room and they're huddling together in their weight. That's Acts chapter 1. That's the waiting. Then you turn to Acts chapter 2 and the power of the Holy Spirit falls and then from Acts chapter 3 throughout the rest of the entirety of Scripture, you know what it is? You know what that is there? It's a revelation of what happens when you wait on the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. Because when you begin to read in Acts chapter 3 forward, what you notice is that something has changed and everything is entirely different. And so now you find a, uh, an account that is chock full of miracles. Things like lame folks are being healed. Snake bites are being shaken off. There's dramatic releases from prison. There's the resurrection of the dead. There's mass salvations. All from Acts chapter, the last part of Acts chapter 2 forward, it's an account of what happened when they waited. Okay, y'all with me this morning? So, so the, the rest of scripture is simply a revelation of what takes place when you wait on the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it's safe to say this morning two things. I think I can make two claims. Number one, the waiting certainly worked. Because they waited on the power of the Holy Spirit, it worked in their lives and it made things different, right? 
Everybody agree with that? The second thing that I would say was this. The waiting was worth it. Okay, y'all are looking at me like, like I don't know. So let me just explain that. This backwards, fearful, weak group of individuals are so clothed in power by the Holy Spirit that by the time you turn forward into Acts chapter 17, the author says that the people in the community begin to describe the same group of people that were terrified, the same group of people that were demoralized, same people that wanted to quit and go back to fishing. Now they describe the same group of people like this. These are the men that have turned the world upside down. Something changed. It's the thread. It's the thread. What they waited on changed everything for them and it changed everything for us. Do you recognize that to this day the encounter that this, these, this group of men and women had in Acts chapter 2 has at that moment launched the fastest growing movement in the world? That's what it did. Are y'all with me? Okay. So I think that if that's the case, then is it also important to stop at this moment and back up a little bit and understand because what we think is that that thread was for them and it wasn't for anybody else. But we need to back up even before they experience the baptism and the power of the Holy Spirit and understand that this thread that God gave them on Acts chapter 2 had already been promised and it wasn't just promised to them, it was promised to everybody. Joel chapter 2, you know, if you're a good Pentecostal, you know Joel chapter 2. Verse 28 says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Another version says it like this, this, this first part, part, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you're every kind of people. Yeah, you fit, you fit, you fit in a category. You're every kind of people. So here's, here's my, here's my premise this morning. If it was worth, to, worth it to wait, and it undeniably was, and if what they waited on was designated for every kind of people, and it wasn't some special class or section of society, then the question begs to be asked this morning. Here's the question. If, if it was worth waiting on, and if it was promised to every Every person that wanted it, here's the here's the question that I gotta ask you. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Here's why I ask you. This great and promised gift from God is ours to have and ours to utilize. And yet many of us have never encountered or experienced the Holy Spirit. In fact, uh, a survey was done recently of the six major Pentecostal denominations in the country. The six, which we happen to be one of. They did a survey, and out of those six Pentecostal denominations, they discovered that less than 40% of the individuals attending Pentecostal churches have ever personally experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Maybe that don't bother anybody else. That bothers me. Because just... Parking in the garage don't make you a Corvette, right? I mean, you, you go in the Corvette, you go in the garage all day long, go, brum, 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 and that will never make you a Corvette. And just attending a Pentecostal church does not make you Pentecostal. Less than 40%. Okay. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Could I submit to you this morning as I begin to think about this, 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 this gift that is worth the wait? And this gift that presented so much change for them. Could I just submit and say to you that maybe, just maybe, we're waiting on the wrong thing. Because as I read the scripture, Jesus told the disciples to go back to Jerusalem and wait on power. That's what he told them to wait on. Go back to Jerusalem and wait on power. And I would submit to you that many of us are waiting on the wrong thing. I, I would submit to you that some of us have been waiting on powerful services. I think some of us have been waiting on goosebumps. I think some of us wait on tongues or a prayer language and act as if that's the goal and that that is the end and the climax of the experience rather than the indicator of the beginning 
of the experience. I think that many of us are waiting on gifts and we're waiting on spiritual shows and displays and we're waiting on more instruction and we're waiting on the right lights and we're waiting on the right song and we're waiting, waiting on the right feeling. All this time we're waiting on this stuff. We're waiting on a different answer or solution because we don't like this one. Well, I'm sorry, Jesus. You told us to wait on power, but this one makes me a little bit nervous because it makes me uncomfortable and I don't know how to control this one and so I don't, I'm don't. i just nervous. So I need a different solution. I want what I can understand. I want what I can figure out. Let me... Okay, all right. Y'all ain't, y'all ain't been in the services I've been in. All right. We wait on all this stuff, and many times I think what happens is we, we wait on that stuff, and we even experience some of that stuff, and what we discover is that those feelings are fleeting, and they don't produce the change, the one thing that the Holy Spirit was promised to produce, and that's power. We walk through life, and we have no power. You can quit waiting on that stuff. I need to suggest to you this morning that what we need to wait on is we need to wait on power. What kind of power? Power to change the world. We need the power to witness. We need the power to live uprightly. We need the power to bring the kingdom of heaven to bear on earth. We need the power to bring freedom. We need the power to bring change. We need the power to walk differently than everybody around us. We need power. We need to quit waiting on the wrong thing. If you're going to wait, I want you to wait on power. Power. That is what was intended and that is what Jesus said would be produced by the Holy Spirit in our lives. Everything else the Holy Spirit produces is incredible. I'm thankful he produces tongues and a prayer language. I'm thankful that he produces good feelings. I'm thankful that he produces gifts. I'm thankful he does all that stuff. But I'm more thankful that when you encounter the Holy Spirit what he's supposed to produce is lasting how? How? Listen, we are to be in due, clothed, y'all get this now, clothed with power. Clothed. Aren't you glad everybody showed up clothed this morning? Amen. Yeah. But we've got clothes on, but some of us aren't clothed. We are to be clothed. In other words, we are to be consumed with power. An encounter that changes how we live. An encounter that changes how we think. That changes how we behave. That changes our goals, our desires, our purpose, and our attitude. I'm not interested in you just getting a, some, some experience that helps you to, to, to have a better church service. That's not what the Holy Spirit was ever intended for, just for better church services. In fact, I want to say to you this morning, I'm tired of waiting on something that is only only used to produce a good service on Sunday, but then we live a bad, struggling, weak life the rest of the week. This thread should produce power. I don't care if you only glow on Sundays. If we only go on Sundays, then we've missed it entirely. We're supposed to be waiting on power. So I got some, I got some really tough questions to ask you this morning. You know, don't like me? Okay. Okay, here we go. Let me ask you. If you have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, here it is. Are you any stronger? Have you demonstrated any more power? Have you caused any change around you? Are you overcoming anything that used to overcome you? It's quiet in here. Are you withstanding attacks that used to overtake you? Listen, this morning, I I am glad that as a young man, I encountered the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, but if it stopped there and it doesn't translate into power for the rest of my life, then all I can do is mark it down in the front of my Bible that on July the 18th or whatever it was, and 19 whatever it was, I had this encounter, but now if I'm still battling the same battles and I'm as weak as I was before, then all I had was a weepy session at an altar somewhere and it didn't accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish. 
put? Are you any stronger now? And if you're not, if you're not, then I need to ask you and say to you that maybe you need a refill, a refilling of the Holy Spirit. A refill. Okay. <laughs> it's a gift. The last words Jesus says addresses this gift. So why would we not do what he says to do, which is to wait? To wait on more power. Listen, if you're here this morning and maybe you're one of the ones that's never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit as promised by Jesus, I simply want to encourage you to do this. Over the next two weeks, I want to, I, I, I'm going to try to give you more insight into what this gift is all about over the next two weeks. But I want you to understand, just begin to wait in your own spirit. Jesus, if this is what you have for us, is this the gift that you've given to us? If you wanted us to have this, then help me to just wait and hold on for that power. I, I'm convinced this will change my life. And if you said I can have it, then I want it. I don't want anything less than everything you said I can have. Why would you want less than what Jesus said you can have? Why would you want to live your whole Christian experience thanking Jesus for his salvation power but never access this power that he also said you could have? Listen, I, we're not going to play this old Pentecostal game where you have to jump through a bunch of hoops and got to gotta get on one foot and to get the get the, the music going just right and, and get the uh, hugs going from the preacher and somebody slapping you in the head with a big old 40 pound Bible and then maybe, just maybe I can... Listen, that's hard. Watch. Jesus says it's a gift. When I go to my father and he gives me a gift, I don't have to beg him. I don't have to plead from him. I don't have to coerce him. I don't have to bribe him. I don't have to plead with him. I simply walk in and say, hey, you've got a gift for me and I want it. And my dad goes, it's, it's yours. And so the promise is for you. I read it to you out of Joel chapter 2. It's not just for me. It's not just for the pastor. It's not just for the worship leaders. It's not just for the spiritual folks in the room. It's not just for the people that were glowing when they walked in. It's for everybody. But it's not just so that we can display gifts inside the body. Although when we get consumed with the Holy Spirit, we will. There are, there are words of prophecy and wisdom and knowledge and things. Gifts of faith and healing and all discernment, tongues and messages and all this stuff. All that's great. Unless when you walk out after doing all that, you're still just as weak as you were before you got here. Okay, I think we're on the same page. So, so here's my challenge to you. Over the course of the next two weeks, if you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Forget everything that everybody's told you. Just, 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 you just gotta beg. Just keep begging. Forget that mess. Over the course of the next two weeks, you just wait. We're believing that on Pentecost Sunday, if he did it once, and it's, and it's promised to everybody, he can do it again. And you just go start reading the word for yourself. Start in Acts chapter 1 and just begin to read forward and see how big of a difference it made for them. Say, I want that same difference in my life and just wait. And second, if you've been filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you've experienced it like I have as a young person, but, but maybe you need to begin to ask yourself the question over the next two weeks, am I any stronger? Do, am I exhibiting any power? Am I even utilizing this gift? I almost, I almost, I almost want to ask you this question. Okay, I'll ask you. You don't have to answer. How many of you actually utilize and practice the gift of the Holy Spirit in your personal life? Woody and I have had this conversation. If we're not careful as preachers, oh, I'm telling on this, Woody, I'm sorry, I'm going to make your reputation in mind. As preachers, we catch ourselves going days without ever praying in tongues. Paul said, I want you to pray in tongues more than, 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 he said, I pray in tongues more than anybody, and I want you to pray in tongues. And he also went on and said, there's other parts of the Holy Spirit, but that's part of the gift, that's part of the power. You begin to talk to God, the mysteries of God. You're actually praying God's will over your own life, don't even know what you're praying. Uh, okay. 
Okay? So if you're not utilizing this gift, and it's not just about the tongue, it's about the power, if you're not accessing, not utilizing, then I just want to encourage you over the next two weeks, wait. Wait. And become hungry again. I want you to go back and read Acts chapter 1, 2, and 3, and on forward too. You know what I want you to do? I want you to become jealous of the disciples a little bit and go, I have the same thing they had. What's the difference? Okay, some of y'all are really nervous. Nervous. Some, some of y'all are not even from Pentecostal background. I get it. It's not freaky. That's part of our problem is we've made freaky. And it's not. It's no more freaky than Jesus coming and dying on a cross. Why would we accept that and not accept everything else God did for us? It's not freaky. It's the most life-changing, power-changing experience you can have in your life. And we want you to experience it for yourself. So together, over the next couple of weeks, whether you've experienced it or you haven't, we are going to wait together on something that will produce this. A permanent change. Not just a good service. How many of you have sat through good services that you thought were the best ever? And yet, two months later, you don't even remember what the service was about and it had no permanent lasting change on your life. Come on, let's be honest. All right. Okay. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about together collectively as a body, we wait on the power of the Holy Spirit and he pours power in us and changes everything. Anybody want that? I'm hungry for that. Let's pray. Father, we realize that a lot of times we make things much more difficult than they should be. I realize that at times we've made this about things that it wasn't about. We've made it, a lot of times we've made it about spiritual displays and pride and our own guilt. But this morning, much like the disciples from the day you left this planet, we sat here thinking there's got to be more. So, Father, this morning I pray that you would allow us in our own spirit, whether we've encountered the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the past when we never have. Father, there's probably some folks in this room that have come to the conclusion that it's not really for them, but we dispel that conclusion because you promised it to everyone. So, Father, this morning I'm praying that whether we've been seeking it for a long time, or whether this is new to us, that we would get to the place where we take you at your word and we would simply wait. God, I want us to wait as a body for your best. God, I want us to wait as a family for everything that you promised us. God, we don't want to live at less than. We don't want to God, I'm concerned that what a lot of times we do is we live at less than and, and act as if it's more than. But if you've got power that we're not aware of or that we haven't tasted and we're not clothed in that power, then Father, I pray that a hunger would rise in us and we would read your word for ourselves. And then we would be treating ourselves like second class citizens in the kingdom and we would rise up as heirs and joint heirs. And we would claim everything that the Father has for us. I pray you would dispel any fear, any confusion, any, any misgivings. And you would start us on a journey over the course of the next couple of weeks. And individually and corporately. We would do more than stand in a garage and call ourselves something that we haven't experienced. But instead, individually and corporately, you would see an outpouring of your power that would change everything. And you would give us the power necessary to witness, and the power necessary to break addictions, and the power necessary to break bondages, and the power necessary to break sickness, and the power to break struggles in relationship. God, I pray in Jesus' name. God, we want that kind of power.
like it.
It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.
It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.